Well, this morning I want to begin reading the passage. This is Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed our message? Or who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with griefs. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had no, done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And after listening to these words and gazing on the picture that they paint, I have a question. Who is this talking about? And I would imagine that many of us, probably most of us, are saying, Jesus, of course. And you'd be right, of course. These words obviously speak about our Savior. His suffering and crucifixion are behind every word. These words take us to the cross, and it's at this point that I want to be sure that we notice that these words were written long before he came. These words coming from the lips of the prophet Isaiah through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit came hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ came. Isaiah lived in the 8th century BC, so that's between seven and 800 years before Christ. This is indeed a prophetic fingerprint. And today we're concluding our current series of messages that I've been calling just that, the prophetic fingerprint, where we've turned to key passages throughout the prophets over the last six weeks or so and seen how his coming and his ministry and his life and ultimately his death on Calvary's cross this morning and resurrection were predicted with incredible clarity hundreds and in some cases even thousands of years before he came. Remember that throughout this series, we've been gazing with awe and wonder on God's perfect plan to save us. And we've seen again and again 
that his perfect plan was predicted with such incredible specificity throughout the pages of the Old Testament that the only fitting response is awe and wonder that leads right into worship. How can this be? God declares the end from the beginning. He knows and controls the future. And obviously this passage itself comes long before the events that it looks forward to. These words vividly portray Jesus' suffering and death for our sins. His death as our substitute was predicted with incredible clarity over 700 years before. And because of that, this passage has been fittingly described as the gospel, of the, the gospel in the Old Testament. And, and that's really a great description. And actually, building on that, it shouldn't be a surprise to us that this passage is the most often Old Testament passage quoted within the pages of the New. So when the New Testament is quoting the Old Testament, there's the highest probability that it's Isaiah 53. Now, the New Testament quotes a whole lot of Old Testament passages, but the most often quoted one is this chapter right here before us. An incredible prophetic fingerprint. And with that in mind, today, let's take a closer look at these amazing words of prophecy. These words vividly paint a picture centered on our Savior and His cross. And before we go any farther, I want to take an important side trip. Think with me here. When we're studying the Bible, it's important to pay attention to what kind of literature we're studying. What kind of literature the, the particular passage that we're studying is. Experts in language use a fancy word called genre, but I'd imagine if you're not an English teacher that many of us are thinking, I, I don't get it, what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that within the Bible, God's truth is recorded in a great variety of literary forms. Think with me. There's law, there's history, there's sermon, there's parable, there's proverb, there's poetry, there's apocalyptic images like what we find in the book of Revelation or in Daniel and much more. And when we consider what particular part of the Bible we're reading and what form of literature is being used to uh, communicate God's truth, this helps us to be sure that we uh, see the point clearly, that we don't miss it. We don't read the Psalms the same as we read Genesis or one of the Gospels, which is essentially a biography of Jesus. And Genesis or Psalms or the Gospels all ought to be read differently than the vivid and might even, you might even say wild apocalyptic visions of the second half of Daniel. There are different forms of literature. You're saying, why are we bringing this up? Stick with me here, you'll see. We all know that we read different types of literature differently. The Bible is completely true. It's without error in understanding whether we're dealing with a poem or a biography or history or a parable. Understanding what category we're dealing with is a helpful tool in seeking to understand and ultimately obey the truth that it communicates. And if what, I, if what I'm saying seems hard to wrap your mind around, it's, it's not as difficult as you, as you think. I bet most of us naturally do this far more than we realize. We don't read a poem the same way we read a history book or a legal contract. And probably most of us have read all of those things at one time or another. You're probably saying, yes, that's obvious. And what's more, though these are not the same types of literature, a poem, a history book, or a legal contract, they can all emphatically be true. If you need an example from outside the Bible, think about how a poem, a police report, and a chapter in a book can all truthfully but differently describe the same event. If you were in a car accident, you could write a, an essay about it. The police report will just give me the facts, right? Be short and, and concise. You could also write a poem that describes the accident, that truthfully describes the accident, but they're different forms. 
And realizing this is, is very helpful, but I'd imagine that some of us are thinking, okay, why did we just take this side trip? What's your point? Well, here it is. Here's the deal. This passage is Hebrew poetry. And, I'm, and I'd imagine that most of us don't know that much about Hebrew poetry, myself included. So I'm indebted to one of my Hebrew professors in seminary for explaining some of what I want to share with all of us this morning. But stay with me here. Hebrew poetry often divides itself into stanzas. An example that we would understand would be something like the different verses of a hymn. This is not always the case, but Hebrew poetry often does this. And often, but certainly not always, these stanzas structure themselves around the middle. And when this is the case, which is certainly not always the case, the main point is found in the middle and everything else, all the other stanzas, are wrapped around the middle. And this passage that we're considering this morning is one of those passages. Everything is wrapped around the heart of it. The main point is in the, heart, is in the middle. It follows this pattern. It has five stanzas consisting of three verses each. And everything points to the middle stanza. Where our poetry is known for clever rhymes... Right? When we look for a poet, pick up a book of poetry, we're probably expecting a clever rhyme. Well, Hebrew poetry, on the other hand, is known for parallelism and structure. Uh, so when you hit pick up Hebrew poetry, you'd expect something different. So it's a different type of poetry. Now, I don't want to get lost in all the technicalities, uh, but the structure here is amazing. And the first and last stanzas correspond to each other. If you looked at the last verses of chapter 52 and the last verses of chapter 53, so the first and fifth stanzas, we would see that they deal with and point to the exaltation and victory of God's servant in the, mix, in the midst of suffering. So there's this theme of his victory and his exaltation in, out of the context, coming from the context of suffering, both in, verses, in the first three verses and the last three verses. And the second and fourth stanzas also correspond to each other, pointing to the suffering and rejection of God's servant. And all of this points us to the middle. It's the top of the mountain, so to speak. In the middle stanza is verses 4 through 6 of Isaiah 53, and these words are of earth-shattering importance. There we find the main point. Everything points to the middle. So listen again to this main point that everything else is, is pointing in toward. Think about it as the top of the mountain, if you will. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The suffering servant of the Lord is punished for the sins of others, which obviously points forward to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He endured the penalty that we should face for our sins. He went to the cross in our place as our substitute. He bore the sins of others. Everything that happened to the servant should have happened to us. Theologians use this terminology, the substitutionary atonement. And with that in mind, let's focus a little bit more on this central section because this paints an amazing prophetic fingerprint pointing directly to the cross. The focus, of course, is on Jesus and his suffering for our sins. His suffering as our substitute. It's the main theme here. It's the heart of it. It's what everything points to. In this passage, we read these phrases. He, the servant, pointing to Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. Or how about this? He was crushed for whose iniquities? For ours. For ours. 
Upon him was the chastisement, you could translate that punishment, that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And the Lord has laid on him, the servant, pointing to Jesus, the iniquity of us all. The punishment that God's justice demands for our sin is death. God defines perfection. He's holy and we're unclean. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray, and the punishment that we deserve for our sins is death, but praise God, that's not the end of the story. God has made a way. On the cross, Jesus satisfied God's just wrath. As he suffered and died, he satisfied God's wrath that is justly upon us because of our sin. He paid the penalty for our sins and for the sins of all who will ever believe. At the cross, God's just punishment for our sin was satisfied. Whose transgressions was he pierced for? And whose iniquities was he crushed for? The answer is ours. And did you catch the mention of Jesus being pierced? Allow your mind to wander for a moment, to wander to the road leading up to the cross, perhaps the movie that was out 15, 20 years ago now, The Passion of the Christ. But remember the soldier who pierced Jesus' side to confirm his death, and there was a sudden rush of blood and water. Or think about the nails that pierced his hands and his feet. Whose iniquities was he crushed for? Whose transgressions was he pierced for? Ours. This is the gospel. All of us deserve death for our sins. Jesus didn't because he alone lived a perfect, sinless life. Yet he suffered and died in our place. He went to the cross as the perfect substitute so that we can be saved, to save us. Another way of saying this is, Jesus faced what he alone did not deserve, that's punishment for our sin, for our sin so that we do not have to face what we do deserve. Let me say that again. It's, it's emphatically important. Jesus faced what he and he alone did not deserve so that we do not have to face what we do. The just punishment that our sins deserve, he faced it, God's wrath, so that we don't have to. And the only alternative to Jesus' atoning sacrifice is to face the wrath that we deserve because of our sin for all eternity in hell. That's the only alternative to the cross, is to face what we deserve. And Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one solution to the horror of our sin and what we deserve because of our sin, and that's the substitutionary sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus got what he didn't deserve so that we don't have to face what we do. The only alternative is God's wrath for all eternity. The lake of fire. The punishment we deserve for our sins was poured on Jesus at the cross, and it makes it possible for us to be forgiven. Friends, oh, how we need Jesus' death as our substitute because we are all sinners. Again, this central stanza here in Isaiah 53, 4 through 6 talks about us all being rebels against our Creator. It describes it in poetic language, all we like sheep have gone astray. That's not some of us. The default human condition, every one of us, is sinner. And we often, when we share the gospel, say, uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, emphatically true. And you say, well, what is sin? I don't get it. All of us, like sheep, have turned and gone our own way. And, what, and who have we done this against? We have to see the horror of sin for what it is. 
uh, to, to understand the wonder of grace and the wonder of salvation. The reality is God is our creator, and we owe him our worship. He demands and deserves our worship because he created us, and we've turned our back on him. That's what sin is, saying to our creator, I'll do it my own way. Thank you very much. That's the horror of sin all the way back in the garden, but we all do it too. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. All of us have rebelled against God, who is our creator. We've rebelled against our creator. And the punishment we justly deserve was poured out on Jesus at the cross. Did you catch the end of verse 6? You might want to underline it. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. If you underline that, underline it and circle him and circle us all. And we see the essence of the substitution right there. Think with me, I know this is heavy, but the fact is that rebellion against God, that sin, brings death. And for there to be atonement, a Bible word that means covering, shedding of blood is always involved. Now you might be saying that's a bit much, I don't know about that. Well think back with me all the way to the garden, and we'll see one of the earliest prophetic fingerprints. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, our first parents, Adam and Eve, way, way back, God gave them one boundary. He put them in a perfect place with one boundary, right? Do not eat the fruit from this one tree. And what did they do? And don't be too hard on them. We'd done the same. But they ate the fruit from the forbidden tree, right? They said, we know better. We want to be like God. And they ate it. And um, the very next thing that we witness is that they were hiding from God, which is an impossible thing to do, but they attempted it anyway. And they were hiding from each other, and you see that they made coverings of fig leaves, which I won't get into all the technicalities, but if you know anything about fig leaves, that would not have worked well. But they were hiding from God, and they were hiding from each other. Their relation, because sin, because rebellion against their crea our Creator entered the world instantly, their relationship vertically with God, their Creator, was severed, right? And their relationship with each other was damaged, and they were hiding from one another and from God. And what does God do at the end of Genesis chapter 3? We read about an animal being killed and making coverings of skin. And let me just point out that no animal survives when their skin is off. Okay, so there, there's the animal died to make coverings, which is what atonement means, covering, to cover themselves to make clothing. Do you see the shedding of blood? An animal died to make coverings of skin for them to cover their nakedness. It's a picture that points forward. It's a prophetic fingerprint all the way back right after the fall. And then think about Leviticus. Have you ever attempted to read your Bible through just cover to cover and you got to Leviticus and had some trouble? I won't ask for a show of hands, but I, I know many people have told me that happens. You know, they get to Leviticus and they're like, I'm kind of lost in all these offerings and all these sacrifices and all that kind of thing. If you've read Leviticus recently, you know that there is a lot of instructions about different offerings. And this is Leviticus 4.29. Again, an amazing fingerprint. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill the sin offering in the place of burnt offering. Leviticus 4.29. Did you catch that? So when you came to the tabernacle and later the temple after uh, the time of Solomon, but... First, the tabernacle. When you came to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting in the wilderness, and you were going to make an offering because you sinned, you came with a sin offering, and what did you do? You laid your hand on its head. As the animal was slaughtered, all of this was a bloody message of substitution. Can you see it? A fingerprint pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, once for all time. The animal died in the place of the one making the offering. And Jesus died as the once for all time perfect substitute. Can you see substitution in the garden? Can you see it in the sacrificial system in Leviticus? It all points forward to Jesus. No more animal sacrifices at the temple or at the, uh, or the tabernacle or then the temple. And, and this is what Isaiah 53 is pointing forward to. Because of Christ's once for all sacrifice for sins, no more animal sacrifice is needed. These words of prophecy paint a powerful prophetic fingerprint centered on the cross. And with that in mind, let's consider some of the examples of how Jesus perfectly fulfill these, fulfills these words.
I can't look to all the places this is referenced in the New Testament. We'd be here till two. But I want to show a few examples. And I, I pray that as we do this, that our jaw drops in wonder. We see the wonder of God's plan. And that moves us to worship. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection perfectly fulfills this unique prophetic fingerprint. Again, here are just some examples of how Jesus fulfills this prophetic fingerprint. And keep in mind, there are just so many examples. Many could be pointed to because, after all, this is the most often pa quoted passage from the Old Testament in the New. So this is just a sampling. But in 52.13, we're told that God's servant will be exalted. And you see, uh, and if we were to look to Philippians 2.9... We read this incredible description of Jesus. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And uh, highly exalted is a good translation. We don't really use uh, the most literal translation, which would be hyper exalted or super exalted. Uh, but you get the idea. This is incredibly, incalculably exalted. And you can think, think about the fact that did Jesus suffer and die on Calvary's cross? Absolutely. But was there victory after that? Oh, yes. The tomb was empty. He rose victoriously from the dead, appeared to his disciples over, and many more over a period of 40 days, and ascended into heaven, and he's seated at the Father's right hand, right? He's super exalted. 52.13 and pointing forward to the New Testament. Or 52.14, he will be disfigured, some translations, or the ESV says marred by suffering. And I'd point out that Jesus was dressed in a purple robe as a mockery. And a crown of thorns was depressed into his brow. And beyond that, the whole road leading up to the crucifixion, the beatings and everything else was appallingly disfiguring. We can't comprehend the horror of what it would have been. The word excruciating that we have in English comes from a root that means from the cross. Just can't even imagine. Disfiguring. And then verses 1 and 3 of chapter 53, in those verses we see God's servant will be rejected. And if you're familiar with the Gospels, you say, what example should I point to? Was he rejected? I'm thinking of in his hometown of Nazareth when he discovered a prophet has no honor. In his, when we read about a prophet having no honor in his own town, and you know, they, they took him to uh, the, the top of a cliff to push him off, but he walked through their midst. Didn't, they were not successful, of course. But was he rejected at... Nazareth. Yes. Or how about the summary in John 1, 10, and 11? Very first words, the first part of the Gospel of John. He came, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, friend, that's in, friends, that's emphatically true. We're looking, you know, the world was made through him. Think about creation. Though the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. That's rejection. So much rejection. Or John 12, 37 and 38 paints an example that I want to point to because it directly quotes from this passage here in Isaiah. Again, chapter 12, verses 37 and 38 of John. Though he had done all, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed our message? Or, 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 Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I started to quote it in the, past, the version I memorized it in. But Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us, or who has believed our message is another way to translate it. It specifically says the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah. And then in verse 4 of chapter 53, we see that God's servant would bear our sins. And in Matthew 8, 17, this is quoted. This is to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Or 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were Straying like sheep, there it is, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Can you hear Isaiah 53? It's everywhere. Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross, on the tree, and verses 6 through 8 tell us that God's servant would be our substitute. 
And 2 Corinthians 5.21 captures this glorious truth in words that have been termed the marvelous exchange, saying this, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The marvelous exchange. Our sin to Christ in Christ's perfect righteousness to us, the substitutionary atonement. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, an Awana verse, one of the first ones we memorize. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, their substitution. He died for our sins. And what does it say next? In accordance with the Scriptures. That He was buried and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And when the Apostle Paul uses the phrase here, according to the Scriptures, Many scholars, and myself included, are very convinced that he is specifically looking back to exactly Isaiah 53. Probably other passages too, but first and foremost, Isaiah 53, pointing to his substitutionary death and ultimately his victorious resurrection. So many more things I could point to. 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of of the whole world. Some translations say atoning sacrifice, and that's a good translation as well, but propitiation is an older word, but it's well worth keeping and explaining. It means a sacrifice turning aside the wrath of God. Propitiation. A sacrifice that turns aside the wrath of God. Can you see Isaiah 53? It's right there. The prophetic fingerprint. And in Luke twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, Jesus himself quotes verse 12 of Isaiah 53, saying, For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled. Again, these, this is on the lips of Jesus himself at the cross. For this scripture must be fulfilled, and he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. There's more I could point out, I could point to and unpack, including the expectation that God's, of God's servant justifying or making many right with God, he will justify many people. I'm looking at verse 11, the ESV translates makes many, in verse 11, the ESV translates makes, make many to be accounted righteous. Some translations say justify many. Make many to be accounted righteous or justify many, talking about justification. Can you see the prophetic fingerprint? And then there's this phrase, with the rich, with a rich man in his death, in verse 9. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man who buried Jesus in a new tomb. Matthew 27, 57 to 60. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Does anyone remember Acts chapter 8 when Philip is directed and taken to go be, uh, meet with an Ethiopian who's traveling in his chariot after having worshiping in, worshipped in Jerusalem? He's headed back uh, to Ethiopia and Africa. And this is how the gospel spread into Africa. And what is the Ethiopian reading from in his chariot when Philip runs up. He's reading from Isaiah 53. And of course, Philip explains the gospel to him in chapter 8, and the Ethiopian responds. He is baptized, and with that, the gospel spreads to another continent, to the continent of Africa. It can be so easy, it's so easy to point to other examples. This passage is all about Jesus. It focuses the spotlight on Jesus' death and answers the question, why did Jesus have to die? And the answer is, because of our sin. Think about it. Everyone has a unique fingerprint. No fingerprint is exactly the same. And fingerprint evidence has solved so many puzzling mysteries and crimes because... Uh, a fingerprint belongs uniquely only to the person whose, finger, whose fingerprint that is. Today we have DNA. It's difficult to deny your presence when your fingerprints show up at a place. Well, think about Isaiah 53. It's a fingerprint because it's so incredibly specific. 
No one else could fulfill all of this. From the vantage point of living some 2,000 years after Jesus' is coming, without a doubt, it's all about Jesus. That's why I began reading the passage and saying, who is this about? But did you know it's more than 700 years before his coming? The cross and also the resurrection has always been at the absolute center of God's perfect, unchanging, and indestructible plan to rescue sinners. The cross, friends, is not an afterthought. It's at the center of everything. And when we put all of this together, we're led to the most important question each of us will ever ask and subsequently answer. Simply this, what's my response to Jesus? And as we explore and conclude, as we explore our individual answer to this vital question, I want to explore it in the context of two words. One, substitute, and two, serious. Jesus died as our substitute, and this shows us that our sin is serious. It's a direct offense against our Creator. Perhaps some, someone, maybe several of us here this morning, need to surrender to Jesus and receive what he did for us on the cross as our substitute this morning. You can turn your life over to the Savior right now. Don't put this off. Pray. And in your own words, talk to the Lord Jesus and tell him that you acknowledge that you are a sinner deserving death, deserving hell. And ask him to save you on the basis of what he did on the cross as your substitute. Tell him that you're placing your faith, your trust, your belief in him and him alone to save you. And in the moment we make this commitment, in the, the moment we first make this commitment, the Bible is clear that we cross from spiritual death to eternal life. If you're not ready to take this step, but you're saying, I'm, I'm thinking about it, commit to search for the truth. Read about Jesus. Wrestle with who he is. I'd suggest beginning with the Gospel of Mark. Open the New Testament, turn uh, to, to Mark, and read about Jesus. And if you honestly search, I believe you'll find him. It's also very possible and indeed likely that many of us need to be reminded of the seriousness of our sin so that we can gaze with wonder and, uh, on God's grace. It's easy to fail to see our sin as serious. Think with me. When we rebel against God, we like to put it in this language. Well, I made a mistake. Have you ever been there? Don't want to ask for a show of hands. It's natural to minimize and seek to excuse the horror of our sin. But when we do this, we're downplaying or even denying the bad news of the gospel. And we can start thinking, well, I'm mostly good. I'm not that bad. I make a few mistakes, but it's not too bad. And friends, this leads down a path of denying our need to be saved. If we think we are okay, we don't need the Savior. We must remember that our sin is incredibly serious. It's treason against our Creator. It cost Jesus his life. And to fail to see our sin as serious, uh, to fail to see the seriousness of our sin demonstrates that we're not grasping the, the wonder of what the cross is all about. We need to go back and gaze with wonder on the cross and on the gospel and we see the horror of our sin and we see how incredibly serious it is. Jesus died as our substitute, and that shows us our sin is serious. It's a direct offense against our Creator. And as we see the wonder of our salvation and the horror of our sin, and then we gaze at the wonder of grace, the only fitting response is a life of worship, a life devoted to bringing praise to the one who in grace rescued us. We couldn't save ourselves. We never can. But in grace, Jesus faced what he alone did not deserve so that we don't have to face what we do. So in a moment, I'm going to pray. And as we pray and then as we sing, take the time you need. Perhaps you're reminded that your sin is serious and the Holy Spirit is laying a particular sin on your heart where you've just kind of 
So that's not a big deal. Take the time you need to confess that and ask for God's help to change, to turn from it in his strength. Say, I want to live a life that declares your praise. Perhaps today needs to be the day where you need to say, I'm a sinner and save me. Take the time you need to do whatever business with God you need to do as we gaze with wonder on substitution. As we gaze with wonder on the cross, what a prophetic fingerprint of the cross coming hundreds and hundreds of years before. Ask, what's my response to Jesus? Let's pray. Lord, in these moments, show us how we are to respond through the power of your Holy Spirit. If there's an area where we've hard-heartedly rebelled against you, show us through the power of your Holy Spirit and enable us to, to turn from that sin and repentance and ask for your forgiveness. And help us change. We need your help. We need your strength. We can't do it on our own. And Lord, if this is the day where someone needs to say, yes, I need salvation. I need to be saved that today could be the day, we pray. Amen.